the synchronized sound on two cameras. We may see this on YouTube uh, down the road. Uh, uh, <laughs> how many of y'all think uh, skews the, the devil's can opener? <laughs> and how many of y'all think it's a very flexible, versatile tool that if you learn to use it, you can use it for a lot of different things that it's, uh, and it's a tool that you'll reach for a lot. Well, hopefully in this demonstration I'll show you some of the things that the skew can do very well and how to do it, how to, what are the different kinds of uh, cuts you can take, how you can avoid some of the uh, skate backs and catches uh, you might have experienced with a skewer that's given a skew a real bad reputation. It kind of reminds me of a, a joke by, uh, that old, in that movie Crocodile Dundee, you remember that scene where they, they, the street thug pulls out a knife and, and says, I got a knife, and Crocodile Dundee looks at it and says, that's not a knife. This is a knife. <laughs> so, without further ado, we're going to start uh, cutting. I'm going to show you the, the start off with the basic uh, uh, cuts. And I'm going to go from the very basic things. We're going to mark this center. First thing we do, we're going to <laughs> pour in, sharp, use this pencil to sharpen. We're going to talk about cutting the bevel, cutting, riding the bevel. And it's, it's similar the way you sharpen a knife. The, the blade of the tool, this is the bevel, and, and you're going to ride that bevel or float the bevel in order to have the supporting, cut the supporting fibers. And if you think about it, who would ever try to cut a, sharpen a pencil like that and pluck up the fibers? So keep that in mind as we go through this. Now I've got a sharp pencil. Uh, spring punch. This thing's got wax on it, so it's slippery a little bit. And it doesn't work real well. The other thing you can use is a as an awl. The other approach I like to use, and, and generally I don't, I don't always mark the square, because you're going to turn it around if you don't worry about, if you're not worried about sacrificing a sixteenth of an inch or something. You just put it where you can see down it and just think of that imaginary line connecting these corners. And then you just come down this imaginary line from corner to corner until it crosses, and then mark your center. And as you do that more and more, you'll get more and more accurate. And pretty soon it'll be kind of second nature. Now I'm using what they call a step center. This is an inexpensive apprentice wood river or something that we've got. And it's spring-loaded, and it's got these little teeth. There is such a thing called a safety center that doesn't have those teeth, it tends to work fairly well when you're starting off learning how to use the skew because it allows the wood to slip just a little bit instead of just completely destroying the piece. Dead soldier. Peeling, then we're going to go to planing. And then we're going to go to, I think, a bead and facing. And before we go to the bead, we'll go to the cut. And then we'll have some specialty cuts. <coughs> Normally, when you get a spindle, you're going to use a spindle roughing gouge. And I'm going to pretend like some of y'all never seen some of these tools, because some of you may, may not. But a spindle roughing gouge looks like this. It's got a curved flute, and it's generally speaking, it's got a very weak shallow tang, and they call it a spindle roughing gouge to kind of remind people, you don't use these on a bowl, because if you do, you're gonna, it's going to be an accident waiting to happen, because you've got these wings out here that are going to catch, very weak tang, and if you're lucky, it'll bend and break. If you're not lucky, you'll wind up with it in a piece of your body, so you want to be real careful with it, but that's typically what you'll use for roughing a blank, but for smaller blanks, less than two inches, you can use a skew, and especially for little small ornament blanks, it's real practical. So I just want to show you what that cut looks like. You don't use the whole blade, you're only going to use part of it, because it's a pretty aggressive cut, it's a rough cut. But you're going to lay the thing down, and then we're going to remember our ABCs, anchor the tool. You know, we can always get a catch if you touch the wood before you touch the tool rest, because it'll slam that tool down on the tool rest and go bang, and then bad things happen, and ugly words are said. So we get anchored on the tool rest, engage the bevel, that's this part right here, and slowly lift the tool. I'm only using about a half, this is a three-quarter inch 
that. I'm only using about half that area. Maybe you might be better off using something close to three eighths of an inch. It's an ugly cut. <laughs> it doesn't taste very pretty. But you can quickly turn something to, to round. Now if you got a bigger skew, or you know it works even better to something like that. Are you on center? Are you cutting on center or No, I've got the tool rest high and I'm cutting a little bit high. And if you think about it, that's an excellent question. You think about here's the edge of the block. And here's the center. You're catching this thing a little bit like up here when it comes around. Because the first thing you're going to do is you're knocking off the corners, which are pretty high. And then you're going to arc into it and get lower and lower and lower towards center. It works better with something with a little mass. David and I went up to watch the Master up in Chattanooga several years ago. They had two of these on sale, and I certainly wouldn't have bought one at list price. These are Allen Lacer skews, but by God, they had them for half price. For half, that for half price, David, he nor I could pass that bargain up. And it, it has a lot of a lot of mass to it, and it can you can muscle through some cuts that you wouldn't ordinarily be able to do with a smaller skew. Personally, I find it a little large for most of the things I do because I don't turn large balusters. And some of the things uh, a skew excels at is, is things like spindles and furniture parts. You can use it for other things as we'll see, but this is where it really excels in the hand of, of a production uh, turner who's turning balusters or, or furniture parts. But it's also useful for a lot of other things as, I, as I'll show you. So that's the one cut, the peeling cut. We're going to, we'll go ahead and Peel a little bit more. Now sometime during this demonstration, I'm going to demonstrate a catch. I'll tell you when that occurs. <laughs> Before or after? Yes. The next cut I want to show you is going to be the peeling cut. Now the peeling cut, looking at it from the side, or actually depending on which direction we're looking, if we're looking at it down this direction, we're going to be cutting it about, well actually we're going to, we're going to be cutting on this front edge right here, which is about the 2 o'clock position. Now when you come in to start doing that peeling, peeling cut, you don't come in from off the side of it and engage the wood. If you do, you're allowed to catch a splinter. So you always come in past the edge, anchor the tool, slowly lift the handle until you start seeing it. Chips come off. You're always cutting in the lower third or at least the lower half. And then after you start seeing chips come off, you can slowly rotate the thing down and slide it down. You can see from the shavings, we're getting some pretty nice thin shavings. And this is one of the cuts that the skew excels in, and it gives a very, very uh, fine finish that, generally speaking, uh, 120 grit is probably going to do more damage to the finish than, uh, than help if you, uh, on most woods. So that's the uh, cleaning cut. And a lot of times, even for production turners, it might be faster for them to, to rough a piece with a spindle roughing gouge they may even get it down to pretty close to a cylinder, but then when they want to clean it up, they'll pick up a skew to take that final pass to clean up the surface, because it's a heck of a lot easier to cut a surface than it is to sand it. And it's much easier on your, uh, your lungs. So that's the uh, peeling cut and the planing cut. The next cut, and this is one, another one that the skew uh, really excels at, and that's the V cut. And that's simply where you're coming in straight at 90 degrees vertical. You're coming in. And I can push as hard as I want. That's as far as I'm going to go because it's going to block the cut. So then I move it slightly to the side and pick up no more than the 30 seconds of an inch. And then take, take successive cuts on each side. And this is a cut that's used in many instances when you're cutting beads, you cut V-cuts 
uh, to start it off. Sometimes the, the piece you're cutting just needs a, a V cut. And you can go you know, as deep as you need to, depending on how big the bead's going to be. And that's one of the advantages of this uh, step center. You can see I pushed a little hard, and the wood almost came to a stop, which is great when you're learning how to use it. Now, when I first started uh, turning, I didn't have any wood and didn't know what I was doing, but I thought, well, okay, I'm going to learn this thing, and I'm going to you know, take it one step at a time, and I got a, got a hold of uh, a set of a series of videotapes by Alan Lacer, the, the fellow that sells this, this one and three eighths inch uh, skew. I don't remember what the name of it was, but one of the things he preached in there is if you want to learn how to use the skew, you got to practice, and the best way to practice is take a two by four and rip it, rip it into one and a half inch squares, about 12 inches long, and go through that, go through that uh, two by four. And by the time you finish with that 2x4, turning it into, into uh, toothpicks, you'll have a, a fairly high degree of confidence in your ability to use the skew. Now, I won't say you'll be perfect, and uh, I've seen Richard Raffin on a video, and I've seen him in person uh, get, get catches. Uh, I think of the skew a little bit like a, uh, 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 a tiger that uh, you've got a tiger... Uh, or a lion tamer in a cage with a tiger, and, he, and he's got it under control, but you know he can't turn his back on it or, or lose his concentration for one moment, uh, or the tiger's gonna gonna get him. Uh, but this is a great way to uh, practice, and the approach that I used in practicing was just to make a little template. This is actually for for practicing uh, spindle guys, but same approach, making beads. Get you a little a uh, little stick, cut little V's on it. So you can be consistent, and then just start making beads, beads and beads and beads. First, you're going to do a, do a practice your peeling cut, then you're going to do your planing cut, then you start working on your V cuts, and then you start working on your beads, and put a date on it, throw it in a box, do that once, uh, once a day, do it once a week, however you can, often you can get to it. But by the time you get to that two by four, you're going to have a fairly high degree of confidence in in using the the skew, and it works pretty well. So that's the V-cut. The next thing we're going to have is the... Uh, and it, at the end, I want to talk about some other tools for people that, that decide, for whatever reason, they don't want to put the time and energy into it. They just don't want to learn to skew. There are some alternatives for almost every cut. There's another way you can do it. And I'll talk about some of those uh, toward the end. Now, the other one is a, is a beading cut. I've never really cared for turning beads actual beads with a skew because I found it easier to use some other tools but there are some tools and I'll show one of them toward the end that's a great exercise that basically does involve a bead and it just gives you an opportunity to keep practicing and reinforcing and, and staying fresh even even uh, professional uh, piano players are going to uh, practice their uh, you know their, their notes on a regular regular basis to to stay in shape. But you're going to cut, you're going to lay it down, anchor the tool, you're going to ride the bevel. Now in this case, the bevel, this whole area, Mike, hold it down right on your work. This, this whole area is are actually, are actually a bevel. But when we're cutting, let's talk about terminology a little bit. This point here is generally called the long point or the toe. And this is called the short point or the heel. And when you're using it for a lot of your cuts, the bevel is only just a tiny little area. Maybe I can mark it. It might be an area not much bigger than that. Or an area much bigger than that. Because you're coming in at an angle like this. And that's the part that's the bevel. And that's the part that you're riding. And you've got to be riding that bevel, not just on the edge, or you're gonna you're gonna lose control of it. Now let me go back to the piglet cut for a second. You don't want to proceed faster than the wood wants to be cut. 
Now, the one thing about this, you can turn at very high speeds on the spindle. It's captured between centers, very, very strong. And if you get a catch, it's kind of scary, but it's really safe. It's startling, but it's safe. The wood's not likely to come off, and it's not likely to throw a, a really big piece in your face shield and knock you down, like a, bowl, a, a bad bowl catch where you destroy the bowl and it's coming off the lathe. So even though it's kind of startling, it's not necessarily dangerous. Now, if you go too fast, you're going to start getting ripples. Now, one of the reasons you're going to start getting ripples is because you, you know, I'm coming off of the bevel. As I get in a hurry, I'm lifting that tool too much instead of riding that bevel. So that's one of the things, if you're getting ripples, slow down a little bit, drop your handle a little bit, put a consistent pressure on it, and then you should get a pretty good surface. Still got a little bit of a square. This is one of my favorite woods, Bradford Pear. Uh, another, uh, I guess you, you might call it a specialty cut, is doing a pommel, and that's where you go from a square to a round. And a lot of the old production turners that make parts do that cut with a spindle gouge. The trick is to get a nice clean cut where you don't get any, any splintering on these, e these edges and you don't need any sanding. Now you can come in from the other side into that shoulder. Now you see that little ripple you pick up right there? That doesn't give you the cleanest cut, but it does give you a very safe cut and that you're not going to come off the lathe, you're riding the bevel, but it also allows you to come right into that, into that face in a very controlled way. And that's a hard cut to make with a lot of other tools. Uh, this smooth surface is a very difficult cut to make with uh, many tools other than the spindle roughing gouge. Some people are happy with using a bowl gouge, and you can use a bowl gouge, but you can have a little harder time getting as, as smooth a finish without getting ripples as you would with either a spindle roughing gouge or a, or a skew. Okay, that gives us the... Finish that bead, come in here. Now we're going to start that bead. Generally, sometimes it helps when you're just starting, kind of mark the center of the bead. And you don't want to take that, cut away that pencil. You're going to pick up the cut, just past that. And this is a very tricky maneuver no matter what you use whether you use a spindle gouge or a beating and parting tool because it's a three-part movement. You've got to lift, roll, and swing all at the same time. When you finish, that tool needs to be almost in a vertical position if it's a deep bead. And you can't get there by just pushing down. And, and what I see a lot of people do on, uh, on Hands-On Wednesday with any tool, they get like this, and they, they keep doing this, and pretty soon they've got a you know, a sharp instead of a bead, it's because it's a three-part movement where, you know, cut a little top there, where you start the thing, pick up the corner, lift, roll, and then swing at the same time. Now, one other thing that's kind of tricky about the skew, uh, it's, uh, I find, particularly a uh, good thing to learn, you never back up. I mean, if you if you started to cut and you didn't you you started cutting off too much or whatever, you don't ever, while it's engaged in the wood, start backing up because when you do, inevitably you're going to get a catch. And generally, you get, let me go real deep. Maybe I can kind of show you where it comes from. Again, don't try to pick up more than a thirty seconds of an inch, or you're going to wind up pressing and pressing and pressing and start getting a burn mark. When you come, and this is true not only of a skew, but when you, the, the, 
one of the problems you get with a catch is when you get you cut two different surfaces of wood. And one is this, when you're down here inside it and you wind up not lifting it and you get sloppy and you let it roll back and you wind up catching a higher part of the tool up on this inside. So you start cutting up here instead of at the bottom part. Because on these kind of cuts you always want to be cutting with the bottom. Now some in, sometimes you want to use the, the heel but a lot of times you want to switch it over and you want to cut with a toe. Now, sometimes the toe for me is a little harder to ride that bevel, but the one thing about it is you can see better because the tool is cut back towards you so you can see the toe. The toe. When you're doing the heel, you've got all this part of the tool projecting out in front and it's a little bit harder to, to see what you're doing.